In the year 570 of the Christian calendar, Mohammed was born in the holy city of Mecca in Arabia. He was of the tribe who guarded the sacred shrine called the Kaaba, or Q. From the deserts of Arabia round about came tribes of nomads to worship the idols of the Kaaba. They practiced a warlike pagan religion. Mecca was a trading town and Mohammed joined the camel caravans that plied the spice routes from Yemen to Damascus. Through his travels, he came in contact with the teachings of higher religions, the Jewish law and the Christian gospel. At 40, he had married and become a rich and respected member of the ruling class. But Mohammed was distressed by Jewish and Christian prophecies of a last judgment on idolaters. He retired into the hills near Mecca to meditate. He thought of the idols and the tribal wars at Mecca, of human sacrifices in the desert. And he remembered the teaching of the one God who spoke to Abraham, father of the Arabs and the Jews, saying, offer me not a burnt sacrifice, but an upright heart. Here in the month of Ramadan, in the night of power and excellence, the message of God came to Mohammed. Recite, in the name of the Lord, who createth man from a drop of blood. Read, the Lord is the most merciful, who teacheth by the pen, teacheth man that which he knew not. This was the Koran, the reading, the Bible of Islam. Mohammed returned to Mecca to preach against evil and injustice. Slowly, he made new converts to the doctrine of one God, the Almighty, the Uncreated, Master and Judge of all. But his preaching threatened the business of pilgrimage at Mecca. He was persecuted by the merchants. In the year 622 AD, he fled. From Mecca to Medina, the city of the Prophet, which he ruled as the first Islamic state, his influence and example spread. He united the nomadic Arab tribes as brothers under God and brought the law and order of Islam to all Arabia. At his tomb in Medina, he is honored not as the founder of Islam, but as its last and greatest prophet. Mohammed himself led the armies that unified Arabia. Under his successors, the Arab armies burst out of the deserts in the last of the great Semitic migrations. They conquered most of what we now call the Arab world. By conquest, and later by conversion, the empires of the Middle East came under Islamic rule. Egypt, Syria, Persia, the remains of Assyria, and Babylon. And with the collapse of the Eastern Empire, Jerusalem, where stands the Dome of the Rock. Here Jesus died, and here the angel will sound the trumpet of judgment. By the 8th century, Islam had entered its golden age. From the Atlantic to India, from Baghdad to the Nile, ruled a strict faith devoted to the one God, the Creator and Judge. In the architecture of the great mosques is reflected the spirit of Islam. All Muslims turn their eyes to the same holy city, profess the same beliefs, say the same prayers. To those who believe and practice the good, Allah promises eternal paradise, a garden watered by running streams. But Islam inspires its followers to sanctify the mind and to reject the miraculous. In the universities of the Middle Ages, Islamic scholars advanced in philosophy, poetry, medicine, mathematics, art, and architecture. The glory of Islam survived the Crusades and still inspires Muslims of every race and nation to a vision of this earth as the kingdom of God.
The law that Mohammed brought to the Arabs was adapted to different societies and cultures by the rule of tradition, by the way of the Prophet, his life and example. As it spread into Asia, political differences divided believer from believer. But the great achievement of Islam was the formation of Islamic law, a law that extends to every act of life. From Persia to India, to the islands of Indonesia, the traditions and sayings of the Prophet, the consensus of the Islamic community, were brought into harmony with the word of God in a unified system of law and obedience. By the 12th century, Islam had become a way of life from China to Spain. But as Islam spread, the customs of conquered or converted peoples were adopted into the code of Islamic law, some of them contrary to the spirit of the Quran itself. One such custom is purda, today abolished in many Muslim lands. Islam has always been a community of believers. There is no line drawn between religion and the state. Islam is not only a faith, but a law, not only a law, but a society under God. The laws are interpreted by the ulamas, the theologians of the great Islamic universities, like the al Azhar in Cairo. For centuries, the schools of Islamic law have ruled all Muslim life. But some men have always sought to bridge the gulf between man and Allah. These were the brotherhoods of monks, missionaries and mystics who teach a doctrine of love. Many of these saints and holy men are honored and prayed to by the people as intercessors, the friends of God. Their shrines and mosques are found throughout the Muslim world. In the 20th century, the law of Islam has met a new challenge. Western science and technology. To the flood of ideas brought by European conquest and trade, there have been two main reactions. Sometimes the new knowledge has led to economic advance and social reform, such as the abolition of purda and the emancipation of women. But sometimes Islam has reacted to Western ideas with fundamentalism an unquestioning return to the letter of the law. Today, Islam has again become a missionary religion, growing more and more rapidly as Muslims carry into Africa its appeal to an equality of all believers, to a true brotherhood of all mankind. There is no God but God, and Muhammad is his prophet. Five times a day, all over the world, 300 million Muslims bear witness to Allah, the one God. In Islam, there are no images. There are no priests, only leaders of prayer. Nothing must come between man and God. The word Islam means peace, justice total submission to the God of creation and judgment, of compassion and mercy. <laughs> to his last and greatest prophet, Mohammed, God made his final statement that man must live according to divine command. There are five basic duties in Islam. The first is the creed, the witness that there is but one God. It is the first prayer taught to the child. It calls the faithful to worship. It is the last word whispered at the tomb. The 
Koran is the eternal law given by God himself. The creed is the witness that God gave his law to Abraham, to Moses and the prophets, to Christ, and to his last and greatest prophet, Mohammed. I am only the bringer of God's message to mankind, Mohammed said. In the Quranic schools, children learn the beauty of its language and the duties of surrender and witnessing. After the creed comes the duty of prayer, five times a day, between sunrise and sleep. Once a week, on Friday, all Muslims purify themselves and go to worship in the mosque. But the mosque is nothing more than a place of prayer. For the Orthodox Muslim, there is no priest or mediator, no sacrament or mystery between himself and God. For every Muslim, prayer is the sign of unity in Islam, the community of submission to the will of Allah. Where he turns and faces Mecca, there is God. He may worship in the mosque, in the streets, in his home, in the desert. The whole world is God's temple. The third duty of Islam is self-sacrifice, observed in the fast of Ramadan, the month of God's revelation to Muhammad. In spite of heat and thirst, all who can must fast from dawn to dark, some to sleep, others to meditate on man's mortality, on his place before his creator. The silence of the day is broken by a gun at nightfall, ending the fast. The nights are full of music and feasting, a joyous festival of thanksgiving to God for his revelation of the law and his goodness towards man. The Quran decrees the fourth duty of Islam, the tithe, a yearly tax of all man's goods and produce to help the poor, the sick, the widow and orphan. The tax is paid as a thanksgiving to God and in recognition of responsibility for other men. The law of charity extends to all society. It is the foundation of love in the home and of hospitality to the stranger. Neglect not thy portion in the world. Be thou kind, even as Allah hath been kind to thee, and seek not corruption in the earth. For Allah is just. In the last day a man is weighed in the scales of judgment, if he has done an atom of good or an atom of evil. Allah will see and judge. The last and greatest duty of Islam is the pilgrimage that every faithful Muslim should make at least once in his life. In the pilgrimage is expressed the unity of all Islam. Pilgrims set out for Mecca from every Muslim land, from North Africa to Indonesia. When Mohammed, just before his death, made his last pilgrimage to Mecca, he spoke to his companions, saying, O ye men, know ye that every Muslim is a brother to every other Muslim, and that ye are now one brotherhood.
To Mecca they shall come, on foot and on camel from the four corners of the earth. They shall come to gain their reward and to praise the name of Allah. In the plain of Arafat, thousands of pilgrims gather to pray and worship as members of one family. Here are no barriers of race or class. They dress alike in common garments and strip themselves of all identity and distinction. All are equal before God. At Mecca itself stands the Kaaba, the cube. It shelters the black stone where Abraham, the first Muslim, offered his son to God. It is the symbol of God's eternal call to man for submission to his will. Outside the city, the pilgrims perform religious rites that date back long before Muhammad's time. But the climax of the pilgrimage is the day of prayer. At dawn on the ninth day, the pilgrims gather at the Mount of Mercy where Muhammad last spoke to his companions. From dawn to sunset, they stand before God in prayer and meditation. O God, we obey your call. O God, you have no equal. Thine be the kingdom, the power, and the glory. There is no God but God. In the name of God, the compassionate, the merciful. Praise be to God, the Lord of the worlds, master of the day of judgment. Thee only do we worship, thee only do we call for help. Show us the straight path, the path of those whom thou hast blessed.